So what I wanted to do today is to kind of engage with sociological work, uh, particularly more recent sociological work on collective trauma and nationalism from a historical sociology point of view. So much of what I will be talking about is really theoretical, uh, with an aim that we can discuss this in, in a specific uh, empirical context. So I took the title of the conference uh, literally, so I'm looking beyond the Balkans, if you like, to see uh, what are these universal principles that underpin this relationship between uh, collective trauma and nationalism. Uh, so what I'll do in this presentation, I will look at some leading uh, uh, interpretations of, of collective trauma in sociology uh, uh, and in the nationalism studies. I will uh, zoom in on two main representatives, if you like, of, of the current, the current debates. And then in the second part of the presentation, I will offer an alternative interpretation, how we can uh, really uh, tease out this relationship between nationalism and collective trauma. Okay, so uh, in some respects, uh, the, the whole concept of collective trauma has been uh, uh, crucial for many nationalist narratives. It's, it, you, you could say that it's impossible to find a nationalist narrative without uh, uh, invoking a sense of, of, of traumatic past. You know, these could be uh, victories uh, uh, with, with huge casualties, and they, they could be historical defeats that have happened throughout history that are uh, commemorated, uh, uh, codified, remembered. Uh, uh, so, so in that sense, you can say that there is no nationalism without these uh, collective traumatic images. But what's also interesting is that if you look throughout uh, uh, scholarship on, on nationalism, uh, there is very little uh, systematic approach to study this, this like, <coughs> relation between trauma, collective trauma and, and, and nationalism. Uh, uh, in, in some respect, that's taken as given. You know, much, much of nationalism scholarships assumes that you know, this is it, something is straightforward. Uh, uh, while others who study trauma tend not to engage as much with nationalism. So what I want to do is to look at these two influential theories, Jeffrey Alexander's uh, theory of collective trauma, which has been uh, quite influential, I think, in sociology and outside sociology to some extent uh, lately. This is the whole uh, uh, Yale School of Cultural Sociology. Uh, and they don't really deal much with nationalism, but obviously the examples that they use uh, tend to, to be very nationalistic. Uh, and then I'll be looking a little bit at the uh, ethno-symbolist approach of Anthony Smith, who is all obviously about nationalism, it's a theory of nationalism, and it's a theory of nationalism, uh, where trauma seems to be kind of very strongly present, but rarely, he rarely uses this term. Uh, and both of them are quite compatible, in, in a sense that they are both culturalist uh, interpretations of this relationship. Okay, so uh, let's take a look very briefly. I mean, I presume some of you who study uh, collective trauma have come across uh, Alexander's work, so I won't be spending too much time on it. Just to kind of get, give you the gist, gist of, of, of the main argument. So Alexander sees, he uses the term cultural trauma rather than collective trauma, uh, because it is important to, for him to emphasize the, the cultural underpinning of, of, of any, any uh, uh, claim for cultural, for uh, collective trauma. So kind of this, this is a very vague general definition where he argues that cultural trauma is really about groups feeling they've been subjected to an awful event that leaves uh, scars, marks upon their group awareness, marking their memories forever, changing their future <coughs> in irreversible ways and so on. Uh, it's not, not a kind of a, a, a straightforward definition, but it's kind of general description. If you like. The main issue for, for uh, uh, this cultural sociology perspective is that uh, the focus shifts from, from the actual experience of trauma, you know, something that uh, those of you who study trauma on an individual level focus on most extensively, on representation. So for him, uh, collective trauma does not really emerge from the events themselves. So events are secondary, if you like, in his analysis. But what matters is what he calls the socially mediated attribution. So it is really about framing of cultural framing of what has happened in the past. Uh, he is quite critical of really uh, uh, any theory that looks at, uh, at collective trauma as being causally linked with, with the representation. So in a sense, he uh, uh, writes critically against what he calls the enlightenment approach, which you know, sees uh, trauma as, as something that interrupts everyday uh, you know, healthy uh, life. And, and in, in a sense, it's, a, it's sort of like a dramatic, painful event, uh, which 
had, has to be kind of dealt with in, in, in some, some rational way to, to you know, alleviate the problem. He's also critical of the psychoanalytical approach, which focuses obviously on repression of, of traumatic past, <laughs> traumatic events. Uh, so for him, what matters really on, on the collective level, so he's not really focusing as much on the, on the, on the personal level, is the, is the, is the uh, 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 challenge to the meaning. This trauma is about collective meanings that, that provide sense that, that, as he said, it is the challenge to meaning that provides sense of shock fear, not the events themselves. So in some respect, you can say this is a, a common thing that we have generally in social science. You know, we argue that a lot of what we do is socially constructed, so in that respect, trauma is also socially constructed. But he goes a bit further in a sense that he's arguing that the event might be secondary. In a sense, what really matters is the representation. So there is a huge gap between the event and the representation. Uh, so for, for generally for that perspective, uh, uh, it, it, we have to focus on, on, on cultural coding, if you like, of, of, of the previous events. Why are some events uh, singled out, uh, commemorated, remembered, invoked periodically, and others are, are not there, they're not present. Because obviously history is full of traumatic events, and only some events are remembered. Uh, as I said, he goes further in a sense that he argues that uh, experience is secondary. What matters is really representation. Uh, let me just see. Okay. Uh, another point which is relevant here is that he argues that uh, we have to focus on these carrier groups that uh, uh, use these frames, cultural frames, cultural narratives, uh, to, to generate the, the, the remembrance of or commemoration of, of, of traumatic events. So it is the carrier groups that decide uh, you know, which form of social pain is fundamental to who, what we are, what we stand for, you know, it is about our definition of where we want to go. So collective trauma becomes a, a cultural, cultural narrative. So can, to, to put it very simply for him, cultural trauma is really a, a narrative. That's what, what matters. So, as I said, uh, the, the, the cultural sociology perspective doesn't focus explicitly on nationalism, but a lot of their examples uh, are, come from the nationalist narratives. Uh, and, you know, if you look at the, you know, lots of nationalist narratives, they all have a, a commemorations of, of specific historical episodes. I've picked up three here, which are kind of quite well known. Uh, and, you know, in, in the Balkan context, obviously, the 1389 Kosovo uh, 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 battle, which obviously historically is, is very, it's a mythical, nobody really knows what happened at, at that time in Kosovo, but it has become a very uh, important uh, 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 nationalist, for a na nationalist frame uh, to, to you know, represent pain, to represent trauma uh, from you know, much of uh, 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 Serbian history, largely from the 19th century onwards, it didn't really exist before. Uh, we have a similar thing with obviously Masada, uh, suicides in, in <coughs> Israel and the, the, the role it plays in, in, in kind of the commemorating the past events and struggle of civilians against the Roman Empire, things like that. Or in Greek context, uh, 1803, uh, then so uh, Zalongo, where the supposedly women and children uh, sacrificed themselves uh, and you know, died, uh, uh, jumped from the cliff not to end up with, uh, uh, in the hands of the Ottoman soldiers and things like that. But there are many of these examples. So there are kind of obvious uh, 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 traumatic episodes, but what matters is how these events are shaped, how they are framed uh, to construct specific cultural narratives. So all of these three are, have become crucial for you know, Serbian nationalist narrative, for uh, Israeli nationalist narrative, for Greek nationalist narrative. So they've been commemorated, framed, and, and so on. Okay, so that's very simple uh, uh, kind of uh, take on, on uh, uh, Alexander's uh, cultural sociology. Now, we'll take a look at Anthony Smith, uh, who comes from the nationalism studies, uh, and who really studies nationalism more than trauma, but trauma it, it, it kind of appears occasionally here and there. It, it doesn't really use the term as much, uh, but it's, it's kind of very uh, implicit, implicitly there in some respect. I won't go into details of Smith's theory, but generally he's, he's uh, represented the so-called ethnic-symbolic school, which argues that uh, although nationalism is a modern phenomenon, <coughs> argues that nations uh, are not modern completely, that they uh, uh, have cultural roots, so we have the ethnic origins of nations, and that 
that this continuity matters uh, in, in moral terms, in cultural terms. So uh, the term that he uses, ethnic, is a French term really for ethnic communities, for en entities that existed before modernity, and how uh, nationalism dropped, but he essentially uses these ethnic identities from the past in order to forge a uh, you know, sense of nation and so on. What matters here is that uh, uh, the link, this, this link from the ethnic to nation has something to do with, with, uh, with values, with cultural values, these transgenerational values. And, and what he analyzes is really the role, the role of myths and memories, collective myths and memories, and where trauma obviously plays an important part. So uh, uh, it, it is really these myths, shared myths from the past, and we can go back again to Kosovo, to Masada, to all of these others, example, to see what role they play. And for him, one, one of the central roles is this, this sense of meaning. You know, it's kind of the provides sense of moral responsibility. The fact that these uh, people died uh, in, in, in Kosovo or in, in Masada uh, invokes sense of moral responsibility. If you are a proper Serb, a proper Israeli, a proper Greek, you have to behave in a certain way in order to commemorate this tragedy. Uh, one of the key issues for him is the myth of common descent. Uh, where myth really helps to establish this link between the present and past events by imposing these moral obligations on, 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 on uh, descendants because of the behavior of their uh, forefathers or grandparents and so on. So for Smith, nationalism is really a, a, a form of civil religion uh, that entails periodic worship of totemic uh, symbols, you know, sacrifices uh, that have been done in, in the past. Uh, so in a sense, you can say this is very Durkheimian type of uh, view of the, of the work. What matters is this kind of sense of uh, ethical responsibility towards the ancestors. So we have, you know, the commemorations of the glorious death. The glorious death is, is a inscription one can find in, in, a, in London, you know, kind of in memory of the First World War, uh, the dead soldiers. But it had, has become a kind of a symbol of all of those who have died in the name of the nation. They've sacrificed themselves for the nation. So in that sense, it really matters great. In this context, he, see, he sees nations as, as uh, sacred communities. So it's very strong, strong kind of religious overtones that one can encounter in nationalist discourses. Uh, you know, the, the, the mythology of blood sacrifice, you know, is, is crucial, uh, you know, kind of for, for nationalist narrative, most nationalist narratives, and the mythologies of glorious dead, uh, uh, for him, this is what shapes, you know, uh, what, what makes national identities durable, uh, you know, long term. Uh, and in that context, again, trauma seems to be very, very important, central. Uh, particularly because his focus is really on rituals and ceremonies of uh, uh, commemoration of, of traumatic past, traumatic events, the notion of fallen soldiers or, or civilians who sacrifice themselves for the nation and things like that. So he said, this combines private grief with the trauma and survival of the nation in the face of the enemies and of the repeated blood sacrifice of its youth to ensure the regeneration of the nation. So this is a kind of common theme, if you like, in many nationalisms. Okay, so again, this is very briefly uh, on both of these approaches. Uh, but uh, what I want to do, I mean, they're obviously useful in many respects. They kind of emphasize some elements, uh, you know, uh, uh, that you know, the, the importance of trout, if you like, of cultural uh, coding, cultural representation. But there are certain limits to this perspective, and I'll just identify a few of those limits before I move on to how I see this relationship. Uh, one of these uh, problems of cultural perspective is uh, a general conflation of, of, of the three levels, the individual level, the, the, the le level of small groups, and the, level, the macro level, the level of social organizations. Uh, obviously, uh, human beings behave very differently. We know, both sociology and social psychology, that human beings di behave differently in, in very small groups and as individuals and as members of large uh, uh, scale uh, collectivities. Uh, so, in a sense, when we use the term trauma, uh, uh, this is obviously a medical term. Uh, uh, it, is, it, has, it originates from, uh, as, as, as a form of a medical condition, uh, linked to specific uh, you know, individual experience. Uh, uh, when we move further away from there onto the collective plane, particularly macro plane, when we're talking about nation states uh, as large as India and China, where you have billions of people, <coughs> that this becomes more of a metaphor 
ra ra rather than a kind of medical condition, because we couldn't talk about billions of people having a particular medical condition, because then, you know, what is the difference between uh, being sick and, and healthy? Uh, so, so in a sense, uh, some of this is quite present, particularly in Smith, but to some extent in, in, in cultural sociology as well. Uh, you know, no clear differentiation between these different levels. Uh, what I will focus on a little bit later is, is also is this kind of uh, differentiation between the macro group and the micro group. You know, how people uh, behave when they are in face-to-face -face interaction you know, and why this matters for nationalism. Because nationalism speaks in the name of huge groups. It, you know, it speaks in the name of millions and billions of people. Uh, and, and why this resonates to our face-to-face -face interaction in modernity obviously didn't resonate before modernity. So what we will be looking at is the role of organizations in this process. You know, so there's a lot of organizational ideological work that is put into maintaining this, you know, in, in making uh, collective trauma uh, stick to the national narrative. So that's, that's important. Second problem with this perspective is uh, it tends to overemphasize the integrative quality of, of collective trauma. So this is, I think, generally a problem of all Durkheimian approaches, all the culturalist approaches. Uh, you know, they assume that the relationship between, uh, you know, nationalist uh, experience, if you like, and, and, and collective, uh, the commemoration of collective trauma is somehow, uh, you know, inevitably linked. But this is not an automatic process, uh, because commemorations are obviously often quite manipulative. They change in time. Some things are commemorated, commemorated intensively uh, at some point in time, and then not at all. And, and, and you know, as, as social conditions change, so commemorations do as well. Uh, it is also interesting to look, let's say, in the context of, of Srebrenica as well, how uh, now this has been, become a very much an important uh, uh, event to be commemorated. Well, immediately after the war, there was much less uh, focus on, on this conflict at the expense of others. Now we have this certain hierarchy you know, the, let's say mass killings in Prieger or in Michigan or other places don't really see, receive as much attention, although they are part of the same project, if you like. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, this has something to do also with, with the framing uh, and with the timing, if you like, of how things are, are uh, you know, linked with social organizations and ideology as well. Uh, <clears throat> so, w without these organizational and ideological forces, if you like, uh, 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 the uh, collective trauma will not be, will never be part of the national project, the nationalist project as well. So there is a general problem with this perspective, it's epistemological idealism. You know, you see that with, with Smith, who said explicitly, the trauma, the collective trauma is not about experience, it's about frames. But, you know, without uh, experience, without materiality, it's very difficult to, to generate. You cannot obviously manufacture uh, uh, a trauma out of nothing, it has to relate to something. So we need materiality as well as, as ideas too. Uh, the third issue is that uh, this perspective tends to, uh, particularly with Smith, exaggerate the role of, of actual sacrifice in forging national, national solidarity. Uh, uh, I think Alexander is less, less focused on this issue, uh, but you know, sometimes we assume that the fact that people say, I will die for my nation, that they will actually do that. You know, often people like, you know, there's a lot of rhetoric and, and you know, those who study uh, behavior of soldiers on, on the battlefield show that you know, often soldiers really uh, you know, might speak in, in, the, in the name of grand ideologies such as nationalism or uh, something else, but in reality they often die for their candidates or people that are very close to them or their family members, some kind of very mi mi uh, uh, micro level uh, uh, sense of solidarity. Uh, so we, we, we cannot take these claims at face value. Um, and, you know, in, in that sense, uh, you know, the whole point that I already made about how trauma captures some things and ignore others. Okay, so now focus on, on how I see this relationship. And this is largely done through the, uh, uh, my previous work. I've tra tr tried to kind of develop uh, this uh, organization along the Ray view. So essentially, it's kind of historical sociology uh, of... Uh, which looks at the transformation of social relations over very long periods of time, so over 10 to 1,000 years, a thousand uh, years, so from, from the, essentially the first uh, uh, pristine states and before the pristine states, the, the uh, chief doms and uh, city states, and I look at the transformation of social organizations and ideology 
so obviously I don't have time to go into details here, but I'll just give you a gist of how I see these things, and then I, I will apply this to, to the relationship between nationalism and political trauma. So I, I focus on three processes, which I call cumulative representation of coercion, um, or simply, essentially, organizational coercion, organizational power. How coercion, organizational power changes through time. Then I look at ideology, you know, term I use, since we go ideologization. I won't be, if anybody has any questions on these very technical terms, they are quite unfortunate, but they are, they describe what I want to say. <laughs> and, and the third element is the kind of development micro-solidarity, essentially how micro-solidarity links with these other two, with ideological and organizational power, with the focus on emotion. <coughs> so that's the main thing. So I, I've, I, I've provided here a very, very brief uh, kind of uh, overview of what, what I mean by each of these, but if anybody's interested, again, I can, I can recommend you my books, uh, <laughs> you know, if you want to challenge me on any of these, you're very welcome. Uh, so, it, essentially what I mean by people of the privatization question is, and this is a historical process, it's an open-ended historical process, it's not evolutionist, it's not determinist, uh, it, it goes up, up, there are ups and downs, uh, organizations generally, uh, uh, some organizations disappear, some organizations are uh, self-destruct, some are eaten by others, and so on and so forth. But what I'm arguing is that uh, there is a, a constant increase in organizational power over the last 12,000 years. We can see that, we can track that empirically quite easily. You know, there are today's organizations, whether military or state or private corporations, are much more powerful organizationally than they were uh, 5,000 years ago. You know, it's quite obvious in some respects. Um, so we have increased in organizational power and competence for coercive action. For me, organizational power is always linked to coercion, uh, and that's often forgotten and the ability to internally pacify the social environment under their control. So we can say that with the states, that's quite visible, quite obvious. We know from Weber that the nation state is defined by its monopoly on the use of uh, violence or a particular territory, uh, although that has developed really only in the last 250 years. States didn't have that problem before. But we can apply this to other social relations. As I mentioned, private corporations are more powerful now. Churches, some churches, and even some NGOs and many social movements and things like that. Um, so in, in that co context, I, my argument is that this is a cumulative process uh, and it is defined by a number of things, uh, such as uh, uh, infrastructure reach is greater, uh, if there is a greater uh, social penetration, there is a wider territorial scope for some, particularly the states, and that has expanded in the last 200, 250 years. Why is this important? It is important because if you want to look at the way how uh, nationalist uh, narratives operate, we cannot uh, uh, understand them without looking at, 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 at social organizations. So, nation state is really a bureaucratic machine, uh, in some instances uh, very functional, in other instances less so, uh, but it is defined by this coercive organizational frame that helps reproduce nationalism. You know, that happens all the time, you know, we know from Billig and others who studied banal practices of nationalism, how banal. Mm -hmm. Banality doesn't mean uh, no harm, it means just less visibility, if you like, and it's dependent on the strong organizational capacity. So nationalist narrative operates as this ideological glue that keeps nation state together. Uh, it binds the members of the nation state together. So what, what, we, what we see in, 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 uh, in this process is continuous increase in infrastructural power of modern social organizations. And, and again, just a few examples here, obviously, Michael Mann, Charles Steele, others have analyzed this in the context of state formation, you know, how this is increasing the ability of state institutions to tax income and wealth at source. That is a, this is quite a modern thing before states were not able to do so, to collect and use huge value of personal data, to use, you know, ID documents, birth certificates. These are all modern products, and these are all ways to control individuals. Passports that did not exist before, you know, recruitment of citizens to fight wars, nationalize private ownership, uh, and, and so many, many other things. Uh, why this matters for collective trauma? It matters because, uh, you know, traumas, uh, uh, collective traumas cannot be framed, you know, as, as Alexander or, or uh, Smith would uh, look at them without the materiality that I emphasize. And materiality here is organizational power. So the remembrance of traumatic uh, uh, collective events entails powerful social organizations. And this is again, you know, you know without states, without social movements, without political parties, without powerful NGOs, uh, traumatic, traumatic narratives will 
will not stick. You know, they won't be visible, they won't, be, they won't resonate. And we can just think about, you know, compare the difference between you know, public remembrance of the Holocaust or Armenian genocide with the establishment of Armenian independence state, with the powerful uh, Armenian social organizations, uh, versus the non-visibility of Herero or Namaka genocide in, in Namibia or Romani uh, gypsies in the Second World War. You know, this is not commemorated. If it's commemorated, it's very marginal. And there are many examples of this, you know, how without powerful social organization, your trauma is not visible, it, you know, internationally, domestically. So the, 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 it's crucial for, you know, to have powerful social organizations to make traumatic uh, narrative uh, integral to nationalist narrative, but also to make it visible. Okay, so that's very briefly, again, a very sketchy take on organizational power, but I'm happy to expand on this if anybody wants me. The second uh, process that I look at is the ideological power. So the term that I use is centrifugal individualization, because what I'm arguing is that ideology is not a fixed set of principles, it's a, it's a process. It's an ongoing process, so ideologization is an ongoing process, <coughs> and it's a, a process that comes from many different sources. So it's a mass-scale process through which specific ideological creeds become gradually embraced by a large number of people. Uh, and this is not uh, unique to modern societies. Obviously, some form of ideological uh, practices and beliefs have existed for a long time. Before modernity, we can talk about proto-ideologies. They were much more powerful, you know, mythologies of common descent, uh, religious doctrines, uh, in the way how they were framed, although there was a, obviously tension between the, 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 the literary, literary level of religion and, and the uh, uh, oral level of uh, religion. The imperial cults or civilizing nations that dominated before in, in modernity, you know, we have fully fledged uh, uh, ideologies, liberalism, socialism, conservatism, uh, religious fundamentalism, and many others, uh, where nationalism really dominates for me. So, what is important is really that social organizations need some sense of uh, legitimacy, you know, internal legitimacy and external legitimacy, so they need ideological power. Social organizations without ideological power cannot really last for long. Uh, 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 and that obviously involves both states and non-states. Why focus on nationalism? Uh, so nationalism, I see nationalism as an ideology that posits the nation as a principal unit of human solidarity and political legitimacy. So it, it is a way of thinking, talking, seeing the world. And that's very present, you know, Bourdieu and others have emphasized the, you know, that ideologies are powerful, most powerful when they are least visible. You know, and that's the nature of nationalism. The, the fact that we assume that it's natural and normal to everybody is a member of a nation, uh, is, is in itself a sign of potency of ideological power. And this is again a modern thing. If we were to go back to the 13th century and ask people about their identities in these national terms, that would, that would mean nothing to them. They would identify locally or religiously, they wouldn't identify in terms of nation because that was impossible in 13th century Europe or anywhere else. Uh, so in that kind of nationalist uh, uh, rhetoric, nations are perceived as self-evident, as natural forms of social organization, uh, and there is that view that you know everybody has to have a nation at least once, one nation. Uh, so in, in that context, collective trauma uh, uh, is 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 very important. Uh, you know, it, it enhances ideological power. They proliferate in modernity. You know, so if you look at the you know discourse of collective trauma, there is much more of that in modernity than before, and it's also a very different one because nationalism, as I said requires uh, traumatic experience. It has to build its, its ideological power around, around this past sense of uh, 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 you know, victimhood and, uh, and everything else. And you know, from 19th century onwards, when nationalism expands until today, uh, you know, it, it becomes, I see it as dominant operative ideology. I can elaborate on that later if anybody is interested. What's also interesting is that before modernity, uh, collective trauma was very different. It was built around uh, aristocracy, or religious uh, uh, authorities. So obviously, in the Christian tradition, sainthood was was a form of a you know a, a traumatic experience. The the, the pe pe you know pains that, that certain saints, particularly in Catholic tradition, have experienced mattered you know in, in a sense of framing the whole religious experience. In modernity, uh, a collective trauma becomes more democratized. In a sense, people are the victim, not an individual saint. Although that doesn't necessarily exclude individual saints, individual saints can be incorporated in the nationalist tradition. But now people become victims. 
And people is an abstract concept, obviously, but it includes all of us. You know, we are all suffering because our predecessors have suffered. So now we relate to Kosovo, we relate to uh, uh, you know, any previous event, although you know, our predecessors wouldn't, because it was aristocrats who died in Kosovo. They would, this wouldn't res resonate to uh, Serbian peasants in the 16th century at all, uh, but it resonates now, because trauma is defined in, in the sense of people as victims. Pe people become a principal agent in this narrative, national trauma narrative. Um, okay, so, so in that context, obviously, these, these national, tra national trauma symbols uh, become meaningful, but symbols by themselves do not create meanings. That's the problem here with both Alexander and, and Smith. They assume that symbols generate meanings, but without you know, social action, without social organization, without ideological work, this would not happen. And you have often have this kind of uh, you know, <coughs> view which was already, I think, articulated by uh, Richard uh, Mussel in, you know, in Man Without Politics, a wonderful book on the, on the Habsburg Empire, where, where he kind of talks about uh, you know, national monuments have been erected throughout uh, uh, Europe, uh, particularly in the wake of you know, 1848 revolutions. And what you see is, is these generals uh, you know, representing a nation and, and, and people who died for the nation. But he, you know, he's, he puts it, the statue of Victoria's general in the park splattered with pigeon droppings. In a sense, people don't pay attention to this. There are all these monuments nobody pays attention to. Uh, they are meant to be you know, powerful symbolic frames. But you know, as I said, national symbols by themselves do not create meanings. The fact that we have these monuments, that we have these rituals, that we have these commemorations does not necessarily mean that this will translate into actual, uh, you know, that they have to resonate. So symbols can become markers of group solidarity through social action, and that can happen. So an invisible monument can become a visible monument. And you know, for those of you from former Yugoslavia, of, who are at least 40, <laughs> you might remember the way how uh, uh, a monument uh, in, in Zagreb, the uh, Ban Jelicic monument, Duke, Duke Jelicic, who, uh, uh, who was seen as, as a national hero, became a really an important element of, of Croatian nationalism. And the idea was, it, it used to be, uh, the monument was re removed after the Second World War because it represented a, you know, kind of, uh, both, I think, aristocratic Austro-Hungarian Empire, because he actually came <coughs> for Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, for empire rather than creation nation, but it was later reinterpreted as, as a nationalist uh, hero. So the, the monument was moved, but before that the monument was uh, turned towards Hungary, because the, the, this is where the enemy came from. And now, then, when it was uh, uh, put back in 1991, it, you know, it was moved towards Serbia, because this is where the enemy is, you know, sword pointing towards the Ser Serbian border. Uh, so in a sense, we can see how this symbol uh, can uh, become alive. You know, if, if things change, and many other symbols, so you know, the, the notion of usable past. Okay, so these are the two processes that are important: organizational power, ideological power. But what's missing here is the micro level. You know, and that's that's also very, very important for collective trauma and for nationalism. So this is the last one I will be looking at. If you are exhausted, uh, so, <laughs> uh, what I mean, I mean, I use this term micro solidarity to distinguish it from other forms of solidarity. Because I think this is a very, very important. Uh, it, it, it means really the capacity to successfully enter the micro social world. You know, a world of family, uh, a close kin, peer groups, friendships. You know, these things matter to us more than anything else. And traumatic experiences are mostly uh, linked with that sense. We, we grieve over people that matter to us, uh, you know, in a sense of our, our, our closest members. Uh, and what we see here is, is a really huge uh, discrepancy because nation state is a form of bureaucratic organization, although it, it doesn't present itself as such. But family life is, is, is the opposite. You know, so in a sense, you can say the large scale social organization, not just the nation state, you know, uh, uh, Microsoft or private corporations or big churches or whatever, they are formal, they are an anonymous, they are bureaucratic, they are cold. Well, the opposite is the, you know, this micro world, the, the small scale, face-to-face, -face families, lovers, friends, kin, neighbors, that they're characterized by informality, by, you know, something <coughs> close, uh, familiar, something that we relate to, something that we uh, drive, you know, our emotional security from. Uh, so, we, we achieve our comfort, our security, our fulfillment from these small groups, 
So what is really important for social organizations is to emulate the microgroups. So nation states has to look like a family. Well, that's why nation states use these terms, the kinship-based terms, our brothers, our brother Croats, our brother Serbs are dying you know, for our, uh, our, our uh, life or whatever. So, so in a sense, you know, the mother Russia or any of these kinship metaphors, they, they resonate because they involve that microgroup, which isn't really a nation state. So what we have in Smith and Alexander, you know, is this emphasis on uh, that national narratives provide meanings and emotional attachments. But that's not, as I said, automatic. That's not clear cut. If it was the case, it wouldn't be necessary to mobilize people. We would all just assume, let's go and fight for our nation and die for our nation. But it doesn't happen. <coughs> like when you have to recruit people, they just disappear suddenly. So I would argue this is wrong because uh, Without this, we, you wouldn't really, you wouldn't be able to, to mobilize people. We have this term, uh, collective effervescence, from Dirkheim, you know, where he, uh, you know, emphasized that this was a temporary phenomenon. The people, you know, suddenly rise up in, 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 during the rituals and certain events, and that collective energy, energy is created. But this cannot last because it's, it's emotional energy. Many emotions are short; you know, they don't last for a very long period of time. So what is important is that the social organizations, such as nation states and others, uh, uh, emulate uh, you know, these microgroups. They have to speak the language of microgroups. They have to represent themselves as microgroups. They have to kind of invoke micro-solidarity uh, and, in, in a sense, uh, tap <coughs> this microcosm. You know, and so what we see here is a constant attempt to reconcile the instrumental demands of nation of organizations such as nation state with the micro level emotional bonds that mobilize social action. So, you know, what we often see is this attempt to project micro solidarity, particularly personal traumas. That's why personal stories matter so much. If you look at the you know way how a lot of journal, uh, you know, magazine articles begin with, with you know genocides and various tragedies, they always pick up an individual story that opens the, the new, let's say, the newspaper. You hear about this particular individual experiencing personal trauma, somebody dying, uh, rather than the, the numbers, you know, because that numbers don't necessarily mean much to us. Uh, so what happens often is nationalist projects use this. You know, they, they paint this uh, uh, micro-tragedy, if you like, micro-trauma onto the canvas of the large-scale social organizations. And that's why we have the you know, that sense of responsibility and, and uh, in order to legitimize the action of social organization. So, ideology of nationalism translates genuine micro-solidarities into these national identities. Okay, I'll stop here now. Uh, so, this essentially what, what I wanted to do here is just to give you kind of a, a sense of uh, uh, what is happening in, in sociology in, in terms of uh, teasing out this relationship between nationalism and collective trauma. And, uh, you know, I try to kind of offer again my own take on it. Thanks. Thank you all.